Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm often hungry for an audience, so I came here with eight presentations. I've condensed it down to three, which have been merged here, and I'll try to be through my section in ten minutes, uh, because I have some very other um, <clears throat> very knowledgeable people to speak after me. I was supposed to speak about evolution of RFID systems. <clears throat> and um, I was trying to capture the notion of how these systems evolved under the various constraints that have regulated their evolution and how they might evolve under future research. And there won't be any time to say much about what we're doing at Adelaide. The, the sorts of topics that I thought we might collectively talk about are here, something on RFID regulations, something about antennas, uh, something about propagation and protocols, and higher functionality tags. Now, I have other speakers that are very good on some of those issues, so I'm going to talk a little bit about antennas and also propagation studies, and I'll move to that almost immediately. So, talking about antenna issues, I'll say a little bit about electromagnetic theory and maybe something about how antennas work, largely through diagrams, talk about near and far fields, and talk about what I think are important conclusions that you might draw about what you can do with an antenna in the near field and the far field. I think there'll be time for me to talk a little bit about the Bode-Farno limit on efficiency and uh, maybe show you a couple of simple tag designs. I never give a presentation without showing this slide, which shows a, an encapsulation of Maxwell's equations in the source and vortex interpretation of Helmholtz, uh, which I think the more you look at it, the more you realise that it contains the secret of life. Um, but it boils down to these pictures, which show you the source uh, nature of an electric field coming from a charge distribution. Also shows you the boundary conditions you have to contend with when it gets near a conducting surface. This shows you the vortex nature of a magnetic field caused by a current or displacement current. And again, the boundary conditions you have to contend with when that becomes near a magnetic surface. I think this is a picture which will show you how an electric field might excite an antenna and how a magnetic field might excite an antenna. Unfortunately, these are really useful for small antennas. When the antennas get a bit big, it gets to be a bit more complicated than that. Um, well, these are the fields of a small magnetic dipole. You should only look at the red and the blue parts, which show you that there's one field that diminishes rather slowly, only as the first power of distance, and another field that diminishes rather quickly. Uh, that's the third power of distance. That shows you that there are near fields, which is the blue part, or the far field, which is the red part, that uh, we should think about when we're trying to design systems to couple to them. Uh, we're not going to talk about that slide. This is a, a glimpse of how radar engineers work out power transfer between uh, antennas, and you can see towards the bottom there's a dependence upon wavelength and a dependence upon inverse square power of distance. And if you look about that and you think about it, you say, well, I'm going to do best if I have a very long wavelength, and that means I should be at a low frequency. So the question we should ask is, why is that not true? And I think you can come to an answer on that question by focusing attention on what happens when you're close to an antenna, you've got stored energy. So I have what I call a near field coupling theory with some of those concepts within it. But uh, I think these are the significant conclusions. Uh, an antenna can be characterized uh, by a coupling volume, not really an effective area. And it's proportional to the third power of its uh, uh, largest physical dimension. And uh, <clears throat> you can also characterize it by a quality factor, which tells you how narrow band the antenna is. And that, unfortunately, the quality factors are inversely proportional to the third power of the distance. So I think that this gives us a clue as to why we shouldn't always go to low frequencies when we're designing antennas, because the low frequencies have um, very large betas and the <coughs> And the, the um, have very small beaters actually, so the quality factors go up and the bandwidth over which your antenna will work is impossibly small. 
This leads you to conclusions you can draw about optimum operating frequencies. And uh, it's really the lowest frequency at which your antenna will still be efficient. And that often happens to be about the UHF region. So that's no surprise, of course, why there's a lot of uh, tags working at the UHF region where range is required. Uh, we're also recently interested in uh, what the Bodhi-Fano theorem tells us about how, over what sort of bandwidth you ought to be able to make a UHF tag work. And uh, there's the theorem there and a few slides here about uh, what it means in terms of making yourself a bad match over frequencies you're not interested in and a very good match over frequencies you're, well, as good a match as you can manage over frequencies you're interested in. And I think you conclude that if you look at the different problems we face, like um, <clears throat> the USA, which has got one bandwidth, the Japanese, which has a smaller bandwidth but a different part of the spectrum, or the European countries, um, we can uh, ask ourselves, can we go do a good match over those frequency ranges? And um, I think the conclusions are, it does depend a bit upon the characteristics of your circuit. And um, you're not troubled by the theorem, I think, if your microcircuit has a relatively low impedance of, of 1,000 ohms in parallel with the peak of Farad. But once it starts to become a very low power circuit, still about one peak of Farad of input capacitance, but lesser power consumption, it isn't practical to make the antenna work optimally uh, <clears throat> without some inefficiency. So, but th th based on those principles, we have designed some small antennas with simple matching circuits. Uh, down the bottom here, you can see uh, a tag chip, and behind it, there's a capacitance in parallel with it. Up here, there's another capacitance uh, also in parallel with that gap, and that provides a reasonable match between the circuit and um, uh, the radiation impedance. <clears throat> so that's, uh, I think, all I want to say about tags and I think uh, about antennas. And I think Rich Fletcher will give you something substantially um, more widespread in that. But I think I've got time to talk a little bit about higher functionality tags. And um, I think the interesting questions to me seem, can you merge electronic article surveillance and data tags, and I think I'm pretty convinced the answer is not easily for uh, the reasons that uh, to turn them off you're going to lower the queue inevitably and you can't get the high quality factors that you need in EAS tags if you're turning on and off the resonance. But I think we've also become interested in that second topic, turning on battery operated tags, and I just want to show you some simple results for both low power consumption circuits and what I call zero power consumption circuits for those operations. This is what you might do if you have a turn on circuit down the bottom right and you have a, a label antenna which you want to both resonate because resonance has the desirable property of magnifying voltages. And uh, so you might want to resonate your available induced voltage to produce the maximum voltage across the depletion layer capacitance of a rectifying diode and um, then use the DC voltage to apply a turn-on circuit. Uh, there's a couple of um, contexts here. You might want to apply, get about a volt out of the system so you can turn a, a transistor from deep saturation to conduction, or you might want to just get about 10 millivolts so you can operate the input of a very, very low power consumption amplifier. This shows some experimental work uh, that we were doing to reveal the fact that if you're working at relatively low powers, you can get a nice resonance curve as you see on the left. But as soon as you start to increase the power levels, the nonlinear capacitance variation with developed voltage of the diode becomes into play and you end up with that kind of uh, uh, <coughs> resonance curve which in the right hand side is quite vertical. As it goes off resonance, it suddenly drives itself away in operating frequency. That's the idea of a low power consumption circuit which will consume about 10 uh, nanoamps and turn on at about a few millivolts. And this is a totally different concept in which a vibrating magnetic field might shake a magnet which will distort a piezoelectric material which will generate about a volt. Uh, the analysis of that uh, involves things like looking at charge and, and 
and uh, displacement and voltage and torque on the device. You can relate material properties to structural properties if you know the dimensions of the structure. And I think eventually produce this expression for the turn on voltage which will um, allow you to work out uh, that the concept is feasible at frequencies of about 100 uh, kilohertz and magnetic fields of the kind that you can use to create uh, stored energy in the foyer. And the obvious application is uh, theft detection. So if I were to try and walk away with this PC and it had uh, uh, such a theft detection tag based on these principles in it, it would raise an alarm. So thank you very much. I now give, have pleasure in introducing my other uh, colleagues. Our next speaker is Dr. Rich Fletcher, who's a visiting scientist here with the Auto ID Labs and was involved uh, back at the Media Labs at MIT when uh, Sanjay and, uh, and Dave Brock and so on were in the basement over here. Uh, uh, Rich was working in RFID in the Media Labs, which was a little bit more glitzy at the time, I believe. But, uh, yeah, we, we had more money back then, that's for sure. Um, I'm happy to be here today and give you have a chance to tell you a little bit about uh, some part of some aspects of RFID and some of my work. Um, I am a visiting scientist at MIT, but I work uh, also with uh, MIT Media Lab. So some of the slides that I'm going to show you and some of the pictures are are from different projects at MIT as well as some of my uh, company projects as well. Um, the the basic uh, 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 topic or theme of my talk is looking at different electromagnetic issues and how they vary depending on different frequencies. And uh, there's, there's a lot of slides. I'm just going to go through it very quickly. But just to give you some sort of flavor of the different RFID frequencies that are out there and some of the issues involved. So uh, as we all know, you know our RFID, the main goal is to send out some sort of signal from the reader to the tag and to get some sort of response, either reflected power or some uh, uh, modulation from the tag to get information or to use this tag as a sensor. Um, and obviously, if, if there's no power, or if there's problems with electromagnetics, uh, it affects either the turn on of the tag or the signaling is corrupted or you have some other types of errors. Um, I'm going to start by just giving you a very just brief fundamental introduction to some of the uh, electromagnetic effects that we look at. Um, obviously, we have different sort of reflections depending on what frequency you're looking at. The signal also spreads in space. It's not like a laser that goes in a straight line, so you have spreading loss. And every time you go through an interface, uh, you get different types of uh, loss just through the impedance mismatch. There's shielding and detuning of the antennas. Um, at the higher frequency uh, RFID, you have multipath reflections from other things in the room, including the floor. Um, when you go through different slits, like layers of Nepalit, you also have other types of interference. The, the wave interferes with itself. Um, you probably experience some of that with your cell phone. Um, I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the different RFID frequencies that exist. Um, some of these are only used today for EAS, or anti-theft applications, so um, I don't know how familiar you are with those, but I thought it would be interesting just to, to give you a flavor of that. Um, as we all know, the RFID tags come in many shapes and sizes, and it's, they've been around since the 70s. Um, at the very low end, we have um, at 77 hertz, which is an extremely low frequency, um, that's used for library books or certain CDs, anti-theft tags, little strips that are made by 3M. Uh, the advantages of this is that it's a magnetic material, it's very thin film, very low cost, it's good for making uh, different types of sensors. The disadvantage is that it's shorter range and to generate those magnetic fields you generally need a larger antenna and sometimes higher power. That's a picture of what some of those tags look like. Um, 
I worked in some of this, uh, some of these areas to make sensor tags. We made item level temperature sensors using these materials. Um, moving up to slightly higher frequency, this is your common uh, 125 kilohertz sort of tag. Um, it's it's uh, uh, sort, of, sort of the classic RFID tag. What's great about it is that it, uh, it penetrates liquids and other materials very well, so it's used a lot in industrial applications um, and has a, a worldwide frequency. It's pretty easy to, to, to find, uh, uh, to, to be able to use it anywhere in the world. The disadvantage is that it's also somewhat shorter range and you need uh, uh, larger coils and antennas. Um, some, there are magnetic versions that work in this frequency as well. Um, and uh, let's see, I'll just give you a, I'll play this. This is uh, one of the very early demos that uh, I, I did at MIT. This was in, um, at the Media Lab in 1995. We were looking at using some of, the, some of these magnetic materials as uh, exploring how they could be used for RFID sensors. And there's, uh, we were looking at using it at to, to uh, measure the displacement of a piston and also me uh, detect other objects and also in this case detect the squeezing of a toy. So as you squeeze it you can see the little figure animates over there. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot you can do with just different types of magnetic materials. Uh, this is the more common form of uh, these sort of tags uh, and uh, these are still by far the largest RFID market even today used for mostly access control, car mobilizers, cattle tagging. And the cattle tagging actually started, uh, was invented by an MIT grad here, Mike Beagle, uh, in the late 70s. Um, because this works pretty well in proximity to, to metal and is pretty robust, uh, we also used it to do some of the early smart shelf work back at the, at the Media Lab. This was in the late 90s, um, where we had to read tags either through an LCD display or, or through other types of materials. Um, something else which, which I'll just mention briefly, uh, for a brief time while I was at Motorola and also in collaboration with the Media Lab, we, we developed um, capacitively coupled tags. So most tags work with magnetic fields and inductive coupling with coils. Um, for a brief time, we did develop um, capacitively coupled tags, and what's nice about this is that it's, it uses electric fields instead of magnetic fields, but what's nice about it is that you can make a printed antenna and it's, it's very flexible and robust. It doesn't require soldering. You could rip up the antenna and it still works. Uh, but unfortunately, Motorola, uh, they were losing a lot of money in the late 90s due to Iridium and other projects, so they sold their RFID division. Uh, but this technology is still out there and it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting technology. Um, moving up to slightly higher frequencies, HF, uh, for example, 13.56 megahertz. Um, this, it enable, this frequency, uh, you need fewer antennas on your coil so you can make a lower cost tag. You can make it out of foil, however, uh, because the penetration depth is still rather thick, you need a thick, uh, a thick metal layer and also it requires a crossover to do a coil. So it's not as low cost as say a UHF tag, um, but, it, but it does enable a very low cost reader. You can make extremely low cost readers at this frequency and this is, this is used a lot in toy applications. You, you, can, you can buy a reader for a couple dollars in Hong Kong that's used in the toy market. Um, and it's also very nice for making different types of sensors because the value of inductances and capacitances at this frequency range um, is, is, is just right for, for, uh, for different types of, for integrating it into a tag and for different types of sensors. Um, this is some of the, um, uh, another type of reader that, that was developed uh, in my lab and um, for look, exploring how cell phones can be used as a reader and also as a tag. So you can transfer data from one cell phone to another. You can also load up a variety of IDs onto your phone and, and, and read. So, so this sort of um, near field applications is, is what's possible and convenient to do at low frequencies. And obviously another market that's growing very fast is payment. Uh, it's growing all over the world. Um, I, don't, I don't need to really talk about that. Um, moving up to higher frequencies, um, so UHF tags, which is obviously uh, what's been getting the most attention for supply chain, and this is what's being used, uh, you know, in EPC, uh, in the EPC world mostly. Um, it has, uh, the, it, its advantages are a very low cost tag. You can now uh, use very thin metal conductors. You can make a single layer 
antenna, so it, it makes uh, uh, the cost, brings the cost of tag way down. It also has an increased read range. Um, the antennas have a, at this frequency have a larger uh, capture, a larger cross section, which allows you to get a longer range for um, a longer range for your reader. Um, but the disadvantages are that there's null spots, and because the, frequ the, the wavelengths are on the order of, of a meter, you, you get null spots in, on sort of uh, that sort of scale. Um, and there are also chipless versions of this that work for EAS, and um, I believe uh, Professor Cole was involved in some of uh, an early version of this. Um, here's a, the, the cost of UHF technology in general has been plummeting, which is uh, 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 pretty amazing. The, E, the tags, you can now buy tags for less than uh, 20 cents in, in even slow, low, quality, low quantities such as, uh, you know, um, 1,000 tags. Uh, the cost of readers due to um, the advent of wireless technologies and in, in, uh, commercial products and consumer electronics, uh, the cost of CMOS radio ICs has been coming down uh, dramatically, and you can now build a reader. Um, there's a reader I designed last summer, just a parts cost of $30, and it could read um, EPC Gen 2 and Gen 1 and uh, with a, a read range of, of a couple meters. So um, moving, moving up to uh, microwave. So uh, microwave, in particular 2.4 gigahertz, sort of the ISM band, um, this is very attractive because it has a, it's a smaller, smaller antenna. It's a worldwide frequency. Um, there's many other standards and wireless technologies that work there. So you have the economy of scale. So the parts and the antennas are already available, and you can, you can uh, make RFID systems in this frequency very cheaply as well. Um, but the disadvantage is, as with UHF, is that it's easily shielded. Here's an example of a Zigbee tag that, that, that I designed. And um, you, you, one big advantage here is just that, uh, obviously, this is battery powered. However, um, you, have, you can make a very tiny reader that's very low cost. And the advantage, for example, for a pallet tracking application is rather than having, uh, you know, a thousand dollar reader at each portal, you can now have a reader, one reader covering ten dock doors um, for the same, uh, at, at a fraction of the cost. Uh, then moving up finally to the next, uh, to the next frequency range, you have a, a millimeter wave or, you know, higher, higher microwaves. And these are very tiny uh, dipoles, very tiny antennas. And um, this is mostly used today for anti-counterfeiting because they can embed the materials into things like passports or fabrics or other printed, printed media. Um, you could, because the antennas are so small, you can make an array of the antennas and you can use a, a, a you can make a phased array so you can steer your beam around. And here's a, here's a picture of, of, uh, of a little reader and you can see how tiny that, that, that antenna array is. Um, this is a 26, this particular one's a 26 and a half gigahertz. And what you see in the background are some of the printed dipoles. This happens to be printed on a, on a polyester sheet, but um, it comes in many other forms and it's used for food packaging and other, other things around the world. It, it, so it's uh, an anti-counterfeiting and currency and so forth. Um, just to tell you briefly, uh, Lena, the next speaker, is going to give you an example of some of the work that's being done here in electromagnetics at the Auto ID Lab. But I just wanted to mention the, the topics that we generally look at uh, that fall under the category of electromagnetics is uh, reader antenna design and also tag antenna design, but things like geometry, the materials interaction, and the overall uh, propagation between the reader and the tag. So um, one important point I'd like to make here is that it's important to standardize all of that, not just the, the protocol and the, and the reader. Um, I'm going to... Fast forward through some of this. Some of the things that we've done is uh, we've, we've built simulation tools. Uh, some of you have seen this already. Uh, we've built probes that could um, that we could we could use to. It's a semi semi active or semi passive tag that you, we could embed inside a pallet that takes readings of the field. It samples a field and it it talks back to the reader using the EPC protocol. So. Um, you could sprinkle some of these in with standard tags to give you more information about your reader installation. And we've done a variety of propagation studies um, looking at, uh, you know, how the different thicknesses of materials and different properties of material affect the read rates and the propagation. And, uh, well, surprise, surprise, uh, electro Maxwell's equations works. Um, and so 
We've also looked at certain geometries for, for pallet stacking, um, how we can use printed inks and try to look at low cost implementations, how packaging can be, the, the proper packaging design can be used to improve the read rates. Um, I could tell you more detail in person if you're interested. And finally, we've looked at how um, over the evolution of packaging over time, how, how starting with slap and ship, you can be smarter at, about the way you place the tags and, and, and the, the way you fabricate your boxes. Um, maybe eventually if we, if we get to the point where, where the, the, the tags are actually embedded into the cardboard boxes, um, um, we can vastly improve the read rates. And your ROI level depends on your application and depends on the particular company. So in conclusion, um, as uh, Sanjay and everybody else has said, there's a lot of work to do. Um, but um, I just wanted to mention that there's much more to do than just uh, you know, protocol and, and uh, tag IC design. And, and there's also the, the, the EPC sort of RFID is just a very small slice of the potential RFID technologies and frequencies that, that are available out there. So um, there's a lot that we can look at as well. I think I'll end there, and uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. So, so our, our, our next speaker, we thought since this, this conference was about uh, academic collaboration, that we might share with you uh, the results of a collaboration between Tempere University of Technology at the, and the Rama Research Unit uh, uh, and, and the auto ID labs, and uh, Lena Aquaman is yeah. here to, uh, to share with us uh, some specific work in the, uh, in the antenna design area that she's worked on over the course of the last year between the two institutions. Okay, so good afternoon everyone, and it's great to be here today uh, talking about um, the research on antenna designs. And uh, we have um, been collaborating with uh, the MIT Auto ID Lab since 2001, and our collaboration uh, began uh, through uh, the Auto ID Center Academic Alliance. And um, well, uh, the main research focus on RFID at our research uh, institute in Tampere University of Technology, Rauma Research Unit, um, is tech antennas. And I was here two years ago as a visiting PhD student uh, working on tech antennas for challenging objects, like objects containing uh, metal, metals and liquids. and um, this collaboration has been continuing uh, also after when I went back to Finland and it's been very fruitful and great to, to work with the MIT Auto ID Labs. And about uh, today's presentation, uh, well, uh, since um, the main research focus of our lab is tech antennas, uh, I'm talking about uh, omnidirectional tech antenna for passive UHF RFID of paper reels. And this has been um, our main research topic at Rauma Research Unit uh, in 2005. And first, um, I'm going to tell something about the challenges in applying passive uh, UHF RFID in paper industry. Because at the moment there is uh, an urgent need in paper industry for an identification system uh, that would carry on the identification code throughout the whole supply chain of the reel. Because um, at the moment when all the barcode systems are used, they are placed on the surface of the reel, on the frapping, and all the identification is um, removed when the frapping is removed. And then you cannot know anymore like the origin of the reel and that kind of things, which uh, would be important, for example, printing companies. 
So that's why in our approach, we are placing a tag on the uh, paper real core under the FRAP paper, and that has a lot of uh, effects uh, on the RFID system performance and the check antenna performance that have to be taken into account. And well, of course, uh, because we are um, operating in the industrial environment, um, there is all kind of background noise that has to be taken into account, and also the environment can be kind of harsh, for example, cold environments and such. And of course, there, is, there are a lot of different paper qualities and cardboard, and we would like to have a tag that uh, would function with all of those different paper qualities and also with cardboard. But the biggest challenge um, so far has been uh, de developing an omnidirectional tech antenna, which is indispensable, for example, in lift truck handling. Because as you can see from here, um, you cannot, like, the guy who's, like, driving this truck, uh, he just uh, grabs the reel and the identification, uh, which is carried out using um, a reader unit that would be integrated into this truck, it has to be automatic, so the driver doesn't have to look for any direction where the tag is. It has to be uh, able to be read like omnidirectionally around the reel. And of course, in general, uh, in paper mill environment, if you just can identify the antenna with only one reader antenna, that would be also good anyway. And uh, well, um, next there is something about this concept of omnidirectional reading and also of the structure of this paper reel. So here you can see the vertically orientated reel. And first, there is a reel core, uh, which is fabricated of um, a hard cardboard. And then uh, the tack is placed on the core, and then the paper is wrapped around the core. And typically, um, these thicknesses of the paper layer that's wrapped around the core varies between 500 and 600 millimeters. And also the length of the reel can vary, or it varies from, some, from something like 300 millimeters up to 2.5 meters. And well, the omnidirectional reading means that um, the paper reel or the tack can be identified uh, omnidirectionally 360 degrees around the reel. So you don't have to care uh, like where the tag has been placed on, on this core, so, so you can read a tag around the reel. And well, uh, in this tag creation process, there is many steps, and I'm going to briefly uh, describe them. So first, there is modeling. This picture has been uh, taken from the simulation software that is based on finite element method. And you can see that it's a um, very real life structure. So there's uh, the reel, the tack is placed on the core, the real core, and then the paper is wrapped around the core. So it's like a real industrial paper reel. And here are some um, radiation patterns um, of, the, of those um, tack antenna models that we've been um, modeling during this project. So those pictures on the left are some earlier stages of modeling. So because we um, uh, tried different antenna um, geometries and tried how changing some, um, some, some things and some uh, geometries on those designs affects uh, the radiation pattern. And the bigger one on the, of the left is um, the stage we are at the moment. So you can see that um, the tack antenna ra radiates into all directions around the reel. And well, then there is also, um, of course, measurements. And these pictures here are just some basic measurement uh, setups uh, with network analyzer to to see how um, adding paper on a tag affects, for example, resonance frequency. And well, because um, our goal was to develop an omnidirectional tech antenna, we develop an omnidirectional model uh, with which uh, we can 
uh, test the on omnidirectional reading of the tax because when we uh, go to the paper mill, we want to have um, as uh, good tax as possible. So uh, we developed this model and we, we could test um, the omnidirectional reading from all the directions. So we have 16 measurement points and um, uh, four different um, distances and if the tag was identified um, at all the directions at all those uh, distances, it was omnidirectional also inside a real paper reel. And here uh, is the omnidirectional tech antenna, which we call the C-tag, because uh, when it's wrapped around this core, it forms uh, a shape of C. And here you can see the antenna design flat. And well, here it is um, in the paper mill environment uh, mounted on the core before the paper is wrapped around it. And um, we did a lot of uh, practical testing with this antenna design. And here you can see our measurement equipment. And we used Alien Technologies uh, European Reader Unit, uh, Alien Technologies traps as a microchips. And the reader was based on um, new Etsy regulations and it had two watts uh, ERP transmitting power. And here are some pictures um, from the measurements. So this is basically how the read ranges were measured in a paper mill. And we had this, um, we could move the reader unit and the reader antenna and roll the reel on the floor so that we could uh, measure the omnidirectional reading. And here is some more pictures. And here you can see how the tack is placed on the core. And we didn't actually uh, kill any tacks on this process. So that was kind of good news that it went through the process. And well, now I'm moving on to the uh, measurement results. So we measured in the paper mill coated printing paper with real diameters of uh, varying from 1,200 to 1,300 millimeters. And um, here is the data of the read ranges that were achieved around the reel. So here you can see that it's read omnidirectionally. And uh, the read ranges vary, have some variation around the reel, which was also expected from the simulation results. And well, I'm going to briefly tell something about uh, identification of cardboard reels. And well, they said that um, it's been impossible with conventional tags. So we tested our tag also for cardboard identification. And there is some um, more challenges with these cardboard reels, which are larger diameter, and also the more layered and inhomogeneous structure of the cardboard, which increases the boundaries and lens effect. So um, we did some practical testing. And the tag antenna was the same than we used um, with the paper reels, so it was not yet optimized for the cardboard. Uh, so the first, the goal of the first testing was to identify, identify um, the tag through the cardboard reel, uh, which we did, as you can see here. And also, yeah, the kind of a su most surprising and good, great result was that we could identify uh, the real 800, 180 degrees around it. So we achieved better results that uh, was like the goal of this first testing. Uh, well, there is still a lot, lot of work to do on this, uh, but um, to our best knowledge, this is the first omnidirectional tech antenna for passive UHF RFID of paper reels that can be uh, read omnidirectionally with standardized RFID equipment. And it has been tested with copy paper and coated printing paper. And also the cardboard has been tested uh, with 180 degree identification around the reel. So in the future, we will develop uh, an omnidire omnidirectional tech antenna also for cardboard reels. And um, we will test and develop the antenna also for uh, American and Asian UHF RFID band so that we could achieve a global tech that, we, that could be used like around the world. 
and also longer reach ranges uh, will be achieved. So uh, we've talked about this with uh, paper industry people, and they say that a minimum of 0 0.5 meters from the paper surface uh, would be required. And also the tag has to be evaluated in harsh environments, for example, in cold temperatures. And well, there is some other research project also in 2006. So we'll continue also developing the tag antennas for metallic and liquid containing objects. So basically, uh, we will continue on the miniaturization of the Alfano batch type tag. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lena. And our final speaker on this panel is Dr. Alan Levesque. He's a, a colleague of uh, Dr. Kaveh Palavan at the uh, Center for Wireless Information Network Studies. Uh, Kaveh was, a, uh, I think, a chair of an IEEE, uh, the Wi-Fi committee at one point or something. But, yes, uh, actually, uh, Kaveh has been uh, involved in, uh, in wireless issues since the early days of wireless LANs. Uh, those of you that uh, know the uh, business uh, at all in the greater Boston area know that about 15 years ago, uh, I like that slide, someone said, uh, hope to hype to implementation. I like that. About 15 years ago was the hype phase of wireless LANs, and a lot of that activity was uh, a number of uh, startup companies in the, uh, actually in Massachusetts, and my colleague uh, Kaveh Palavan was actually involved with several of those. Uh, start up. So that's a good. But in any case, they're doing some some very interesting work in location-based uh, tracking okay. that we uh, thought would complement this session nicely. Exactly. Thank you, uh, Steve. Steve's uh, provided. Uh, I, I think I should do that. Yes. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, Steve has provided a a, uh, a uh, nice introduction for me. How do we move to the next uh, presentation? who's keeping us all from lunch now. So I'm going to do some real-time editing uh, as, I, uh, as I go uh, along here. Um, Kabe, in fact, intended to be here, but uh, he has a commitment in Japan. So based on the weather report that Steve gave this morning about Japan, he may have swapped a snowstorm in Cambridge for a snowstorm in Japan. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, as, uh, as Steve... Uh, uh, said our, uh, our emphasis in the last few years in the uh, wireless center at WPI uh, has been on location uh, sensing. We also use the term localization. And uh, because of uh, uh, some of the previous presentations and obviously the background of knowledge that many of you will have, I'll be able to uh, uh, skip over uh, some of this. We have actually been focused in recent years primarily on public safety and military uh, applications, uh, partly sponsored by DARPA, uh, by NSF, and with some uh, membership subscription type sponsorship from uh, member companies in the, uh, in the center. Um, it's, I'll leave this up long enough to point out that several people made mention of the, of the history of this technology going back 50 years to World War II. And everyone has a little bit different take on it. My take is the fact that that era introduced the use of what are called technically net broadcast radios, push-to-talk radios. The devices were so-called walkie-talkies about the weight of a brick and about the volume of two or three bricks. And that was the beginning of really of radio net, uh, networking. And that certainly provided efficient communications for uh, soldiers uh, in the field. Uh, but immediately it was recognized that uh, that did not give you information about where the soldier was. 
push to talk radio, the speaker gets on the net by pressing the button and everyone else is in the listen mode and hears uh, the speaker, uh, but we don't know where he is. All we know is that we hear his uh, voice signal. And those radios, uh, just to set a historical background, used analog uh, voice over analog frequency modulation. And those of you that work in the communications field know that analog uh, FM has a threshold characteristic. The received voice is either very good or it's very bad, and it has a threshold characteristic, and you don't know really anything about what the received signal strength is or the received signal uh, to noise ratio is. So in these 50 years, we've come a long way from that primitive technology. I just, I'm not going to go through all of uh, this, but I want to, halfway down, I want to mention the era of 1997 when uh, the interest began in urban and indoor uh, geolocation. Uh, DARPA had a program that was uh, called uh, Small Unit Operations Situation Awareness Systems, and Situation Awareness basically says, how do you find the warfighter that is in a hostile physical situation? How do you locate him and communicate? Uh, with him. We had a piece of the research work in that project addressing specifically the uh, radio propagation problems in the indoor environment. And the reason I, want, I mention it is because the objectives, the government's, the customer's objectives for that project simply were not met. And the fundamental reason was the complexities of radio wave propagation in the indoor environment, and that's what that's what killed it. You could wrap all the all of the software uh, that you wished uh, around that, and all the user interfaces that were all very nice, but because of the characteristics of indoor radio propagation, you could not get a precise fix on the location of a warfighter in uh, in many uh, of those uh, hostile. Uh, uh, urban fighting is the obvious uh, uh, scenario. About that time, there began to uh, be some commercial developments. Uh, Pinpoint evolved into another uh, company uh, uh, name. Uh, I don't quite recall. Um, Pinpoint WearNet came out of the body land uh, technology, which was also sponsored by DOD, the concept to win embed sensors and communication devices into the uniforms of uh, service people and be able to use those as, uh, uh, as part of accomplishing uh, the, uh, uh, the mission. Uh, we'll just skip over the, the rest. Talk a little bit, uh, won't say very much about this because so much obviously has been said and, and, uh, and um, uh, you folks are all well aware of uh, concepts of uh, asset uh, tracking, uh, putting tracking golf balls in there. That was that was my idea. I figured I could save myself some money if I could find all those golf balls that I'm losing in the woods all the time. Actually, someone does make a golf ball with a little radio transmitter in it, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to try it uh, one of these. But it doesn't it doesn't have ID uh, characteristics. So there's still a there's another research uh, uh, another research uh, area. Okay. Uh, try to move on. Um, again, I think I'm preaching to the, to the choir here. Uh, use an old slide, but everything is a terminal today from the co communications networking uh, point of view. We don't necessarily care too much about what the device does. Uh, either it's a terminal out at the edge of the network or it's an intermediate node somewhere within the network, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, it serves both functions in... Uh, in some situations. Uh, this great variety of applications that keeps growing, of course, has, has uh, uh, fostered uh, uh, support for standardization. And other folks uh, earlier have talked uh, uh, to, at some length about standards and the importance of standards for making an industry uh, segment grow. And uh, uh, just this is just our own way of ca characterizing uh, some of these uh, 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 standards, both uh, uh, ultra-wideband and, uh, uh, and, and lower frequency technologies. 
are being looked at for wireless personal area, WPAN, one of our areas of interest, WPANs, wireless personal area uh, networks, and of course, uh, the IEEE 802.11 initiative uh, really gave a, uh, uh, created the renaissance for the wireless LAN industry, obviously, value in uh, standardization and the ubiquitous use of uh, 802.11 devices, so-called Wi-Fi, of course, that's just a, a label for a certification process. But 802, to, uh, promulgation of those devices and the uh, economies of scale that have pushed the price, prices down, of course, uh, make that an important uh, uh, element to be looked at in, uh, in location uh, uh, estimation. Here again, this kind of figure, lots of, lots of folks uh, use, and uh, it just characterizes the, uh, uh, the, the different technologies, cellular technologies, wireless LAN, and uh, wireless PANs uh, uh, against the, uh, uh, the dimensions of scale that are, uh, are relevant to those technologies. Let me get to the uh, <clears throat> um, to the areas of interest that, that, are, uh, that have been motivating some of uh, our work. Navigation for firemen, uh, uh, the professor at early in the morning uh, had a very, a very good example, I thought, of, about hypothetical case of a fire in the building. We all, we all have tags, and he had, uh, spoke about the issue, well, suppose there's a miscount. Uh, about seven years ago, in the city of Worcester in central Massachusetts. There was a very bad and deadly fire in which a, a building, an unused building, caught fire. And when the fire company arrived on scene, a local businessman came out and said that he saw two people running into the building. And long story short, the uh, fire captain on the scene sent uh, close to 20 of his firefighters into the building, and uh, six of them got completely lost because of the smoke uh, in the building and the structure of the building. Uh, several floors, a number of small rooms in the building, and six of them got lost and, and uh, they died in that fire. It was a very tragic event. And after that was all over, it was uh, discovered that the information was incorrect and there was no one in the building. And so six firefighters lost their lives uh, putting out the fire in an empty building. Uh, we at WPI actually have now uh, a funded project from U.S. government through uh, Senator Kennedy's office. And we are looking at uh, uh, the use of wireless technology to try to deal with the problem of, uh, of uh, tracking uh, firefighters in such dangerous uh, situations. Uh, one could also call to mind the recent tragedy at the Sago Mines in, in West Virginia. Uh, and uh, there is already uh, public discussion of how various uh, um, um, technologies, including wireless technology, might have been used to, uh, to say, let's move move on. This is the kind of concept that the uh, warfighters or the firefighters would like to have. They would like to have a display, we call it a tactical display, that would present some kind of a representation of the, the building, for example, and be able to locate uh, firefighters or warfighters within, uh, within that uh, building. Uh, this refers to small unit. Uh, I spoke about that. The uh, uh, a situation awareness the, uh, that DARPA was uh, uh, interested in. This, I, I think, uh, is old, uh, ah, important. The, um, the current DOD interest is in using signals of opportunity uh, to be able to accomplish, uh, take advantage of whatever is out there in the ether whatever frequency bands are available. And so that is a, a current area of interest uh, for uh, us uh, uh, as well. Uh, other uh, uh, interesting research problems, location-based uh, uh, handoff, uh, location-based routing in uh, ad hoc 
networks. And of course, there are, on that earlier list, there is at least uh, one company, um, Newberry, I believe, uh, that is in the business of, uh, of location-based authentication and security technology. There's been a lot of discussion about security issues earlier. So I'll uh, um, finish up by talking about the, the, the two categories of approaches uh, for doing location estimation. And one is received signal strength, of course, which is used in cellular networks. The second generation CDMA networks, for example, use, already use uh, received signal strength uh, estimation. Advantage, the hardware is simple. And the, the, uh, uh, that approach is uh, not particularly uh, uh, sensitive. I should say the accuracy is not sensitive to multipath and, uh, and, and or bandwidth. It does not require synchronization because it's incoherent. It's incoherent uh, signal uh, processing. Uh, however, um, it in most cases will not provide the accuracy that's required, for example, for some of these public safety uh, applications. Suppose, for example, even you, uh, you, could, you could achieve a location accuracy of one foot, okay, and you're trying to locate a fire fighter inside a smoke-filled building, okay? Well, you may have spotted his location to within one foot, but you don't know if he's on this side of the wall uh, or this side of the wall. So if your algorithm says he's over here and he's really over here and you have some kind of a system that supports this to try to help him find his way out of the building, he's in the wrong room. So one foot of accuracy may seem very precise, but in that kind of an application, it's not precise enough. Just, just an example. Um, to achieve greater accuracy, uh, you can resort to time of arrival uh, techniques. And the t fundamental time of arrival techniques are not uh, par particularly new, but making them work in a multi-path environment is, uh, is a very uh, uh, difficult problem. An advantage is that if you can do it, uh, you can accomplish rather accurate positioning with only a few reference points. And it also doesn't need training. The problem is that it does need, while it doesn't need training, uh, what it does need is synchronous operation. So in communications terms, you have to build a coherent signal processing system. That adds to complexity. And, uh, and you also need uh, a synchronization uh, process uh, to, uh, to do that. Let's move along. Um, just say briefly uh, two general classes of time of arrival algorithms. One is distance-based localization with a few reference points. And the other, perhaps a more general way of thinking about it, is uh, uh, a pattern recognition approach where you deploy many uh, reference points on a regular grid, and then you can use a variety of uh, pattern recognition techniques to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, get a, uh, uh, an accurate uh, estimate. Getting uh, to, the, uh, to the end here, uh, <clears throat> um, a, um, a, a good technique in the pattern recognition branch, so let me call it that as the uh, uh, nearest neighbor uh, algorithm. Uh, and uh, I should mention ECHAHOW that uh, is in the RF tag, ID uh, tag uh, business, and they also have a uh, uh, very now highly developed software product, which the ECHAHOW uh, positioning algorithm. Uh, and that's very recent, and uh, so that represents kind of the state of the art with, uh, with that approach. Our, our, uh, our work in the, in the center uh, has been focused on developing an extensive laboratory test bed with instrumentation, measurement instrumentation, channel simulation uh, instrumentation, 
<coughs> and uh, uh, focusing on the evaluation. This gives us the capability to evaluate a variety of localization algorithms under a wide range of realistic propagation uh, in uh, environments. So I'll just, I'll just move, uh, move ahead. Uh, <clears throat> coverage, of course, is, uh, and, and range reading is a topic that's been, uh, uh, that, that's been discussed by a few speakers uh, already. Uh, bandwidth. It's a common belief that uh, increasing the bandwidth steadily increases the resolution and therefore ultra-wideband is the right uh, solution. Uh, the problem is you go up in bandwidth, you reduce the coverage. So there is a uh, there's trade-off issue there, and we don't see ultra-wideband as the ultimate solution. The last topic is a very important one. UDP refers to undirected detect, uh, direct path. It sounds like an oxymoron, but you visual, visualize a transmitter, a receiver, you're in, uh, inside a building, and in many instances, the line of sight path from the transmitter to the receiver uh, is not detectable and all of your energy is coming from the multipath components, uh, okay? And what we're finding at this point is that that is very often the Achilles heel for time of arrival based positioning estimation system and that in fact was the central problem that caused the, the failure to meet the objectives in the, uh, uh, in the SOSA program uh, several uh, years back. So uh, our, we continue to focus uh, uh, our research now on uh, uh, algorithms with, that will allow us to operate in a condition of undetected direct path, and that very often means making use most of the time of the multipath components, and we're, we're looking at techniques like tracking, uh, which works fine if the transmitter is mobile, However, that doesn't work if the transmitter is not, is not mobile. If it's mobile, you can do tracking, and you can work with the multipath components and the direct path, which will occasionally appear in a, in a, in a time record of, uh, of measurements. Um, okay, we're um, also uh, looking at use of uh, diversity uh, techniques. And uh, some of that is being done in co cooperation with Draper Lab. And I realize we're running out of time. Uh, so uh, just beating the drum and saying that uh, localization is uh, still an important research area, and we regard it as an unsolved problem. Thank you very much.